We've been talking in a series of good for the soul. Today we're concluding that series. Our culture isn't really good at soul care. Our culture is good at body care. And our culture is really good at improving our efficiency in completing tasks. We can be very well fed and satisfied physically and we can have all of our tasks done and still feel like something is not well with our soul. We can, we can actually experience an internal struggle and wounds that are hard to describe and we're not sure how to deal with. And so we've taken a few weeks. What are the things that are good for the soul? The, the first week we talked about hope and hope not just that things will improve, but hope in God, that there's something remarkable when we place our hope in, in who God is rather than what we want. And then we talked about rest. Jesus said, to all who were weary and burdened to come to him and he would give them rest. And what we discovered is, is that when we take on his yoke, we do two things. We submit to the pace of Jesus and then we get to share with the strength of Jesus. And that's so good for our soul. And then last week we talked about blessing. Uh, we all have soul wounds and they don't heal on their own. Time doesn't automatically take care of them. What we need to do is receive blessing and release blessing. And this is what helps our soul to heal from the wounds that we've experienced. And today I want to talk to you about joy. And so we are in Hebrews, the 12th chapter. We're going to begin in verse one. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, look at that phrase, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It's actually quite easy to misread this passage. The writer is not saying, look at what Jesus endured and keep going. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, look how Jesus endured and keep growing. Very different thing. We often focus on the suffering of Jesus and what he endured for us, but we fail to notice how he was able to endure, what gave him the strength that he needed to keep going through what seemed absolutely impossible. And the author gives us the key. It was joy. Joy actually helps us throw off things that are non-essential. Joy helps us endure painful experiences. Joy helps us endure opposition. Joy sustains our strength and it increases our stamina. So the obvious question is then, then how do I get more joy? Our challenge is not that we lack endurance. Our challenge is that we actually lack joy. We lack joy. When we cannot find joy, we find fault. And there's a lot of people who are really good at spotting the smallest things that they don't like. And have you ever noticed that when it comes to criticism and complaint, there's a vast vocabulary available to people. They can go for an hour and never repeat themselves twice. It's amazing. What scripture also reveals to us is there's an incredible vocabulary of joy. But a lot of us are not as well versed in that. Jesus not only experienced deep levels of joy, he actually wanted to share that joy with us. He tells us this in John 15. He says, I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Jesus intends for us to share in his joy. Now, it's easy to assume that joy is determined by how things are going in my life. If my grades are good, I've got joy. If my income exceeds my expenses, I've got joy. If people like me, I've got joy. If my dog isn't having accidents in the house, I've got joy. If my kids are getting good grades, if my spouse doesn't roll their eyes when I walk into the room, I've got joy. We've got all these things that we're assessing our joy by, and that's not really 
what joy is. You can actually, I have talked to people who've been in great pain and experienced great joy. I have seen people who went, have gone through great loss and they also experience great joy. The joy is not directly connected to whether things are going well for us or not, which should be good news for us because for some of us in this room today, things aren't going so well. And we think that maybe we're excluded from joy. There's other people in the room, things are going well, but you wouldn't actually describe your current situation as joy-filled or joyful. It's easy to assume that if things are good, then I will have joy. Now, I want to make a distinction here too, and that is there's a difference between joy and happiness. There's a difference between joy and happiness. You can be happy when you get the meal you want. You can be happy when you get the increase in pay that you want. You can be happy when you get the grade you want. You can be happy when you, when you get all kinds of good things. I was uh, with my friends and my wife. This is before kids. We call them our, 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 our BC, before children days. Uh, we also call them our clueless days. We didn't know anything, but we had a lot of fun. And we were out on Cape Cod, and, and we'd gone out for a day trip, and coming back, we were all st- Starving. We, were, we couldn't believe how hungry we were. And it wasn't quite as built up back in those days as it is now. We were driving all over the place. It was dark. We were trying to find a place to eat. We finally found this restaurant, a little out of the way place. We went in and the, the, the atmosphere was just so homey and, and it was nice. They had candles and, and, and I ordered this meal, a specific meal, and it was the best I've ever experienced that, of that meal. I, th- I thought it was the best tasting food I I'd had in a very long time. And so the next time we were at Cape Cod, do you know where I wanted to go to eat? And do you know why? Not just because the food was good. I wanted to feel the same way, not just get filled the same way. And here's the funny thing about happiness is, is that it's a, it's a, it's a moving goalpost. That what made you happy today doesn't always make you happy tomorrow. And our tendency is, if it made me happy, then when I do it again, I will be happy again. I found that restaurant. It wasn't as good as I remember. I know what you're thinking. Oh, they probably let the place go. No. This is what we don't understand about happiness. When you pursue happiness, you never get it because happiness is always a byproduct of pursuing something else. Happiness is almost incidental and accidental, but it's very different from joy. So how do we connect to joy? And because the life of Jesus, he's saturated by joy. Even though the, the, the Bible describes him in Isaiah as the man of sorrows, you see him as incredibly joyful. How did he manage this? And, that, and here's what I want you to see. There's a direct connection between joy and gratitude. There's a direct connection between joy and gratitude. Have you ever noticed ungrateful people are not joyful. I've never seen an ungrateful, joy-filled person. The purpose of expressing gratitude is just not that we'll be more polite and easier to get along with. Being ungrateful actually does damage to our soul. When we, when we live in ungrateful ways, Something inside of us doesn't go well. And when we learn to be grateful, something in our soul gets nourished. Expressing gratitude nourishes our soul. Ingratitude doesn't reveal what's missing in your life. Ingratitude reveals what's present in your heart. There's something there that's not working well for you. And the thing is, we all need to be reminded to be grateful. God's word is replete with passage after passage telling us to remember to be thankful, to remember to be grateful. There's lots of passages. Our soul is nourished, and there's, there's some things I want you to see here. Our soul is nourished when people, others, express their gratitude to us. That's a very nourishing thing to experience. It's so powerful 
to hear someone who finds the language to express how grateful they are for us. Maybe you listened to them when they were going through a very difficult season. Maybe you supported them when they were flailing and failing. Maybe you encouraged them when they were uncertain about how things were going to go. And they come back and they tell you what a difference that made in that season of their life. And when you hear that, when you hear that gratitude expressed back to you, something in your soul gets nourished. Here's the challenge. We can't just wait until someone comes along and expresses their gratitude to us to experience joy and to have our soul nourished. Joy is not just connected to the gratitude we hear. Joy is also connected to the gratitude we share. This is a really powerful truth. If you've ever had someone express gratitude to you, you know how that made you feel. What we often don't realize is that we can experience much of that same thing by expressing gratitude to someone else. Our soul is nourished when we express our gratitude to God. Have you ever thought about this? How much of your conversation that you have with God is about how much you want from him and how much of your conversation with God is about being grateful for what he's already done. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not asking you to put a timer on it because that would be discouraging to all of us. But how about that? Jesus was a very thankful person. In, in John chapter 6, he thanked God for the food that he was eating. In, in John chapter 11, he thanked his father for hearing his prayers. In John chapter 10, he thanked his father for revealing incredible, powerful, complicated spiritual truths to common people. In, in, in Luke 22, he actually thanked his father for the cross, not because he was grateful for pain, but he was grateful that this was not just a random act of violence that was going to be committed against him, but there was a purpose in it that would provide redemption for untold numbers of people throughout history. He was grateful for that. It's amazing what people can endure when you think there's a purpose behind it. I've seen people laying in hospital rooms who have been told they have only days or even hours left to live. And I've seen them able to express joy because they have seen how God used the situation to bring healing to a family member or to give hope to somebody else or to give them clarity about what really mattered in those moments. It's absolutely amazing. So Jesus was very grateful. Our soul is also nourished when we express gratitude to others. When we express gratitude to others. Let, let's just try this. Everyone say, thank you. Isn't that two little words that can make such a big difference? And we hear them so rarely today. Um, and saying thank you is good, but there's a way to even improve on that. And that is to include Why? you are thanking someone. It's so powerful for someone else to hear. And here's the fascinating thing. When we express gratitude to God and when we express gratitude to others, our soul is nourished. Something gets healthier inside of us. I'll talk in just a minute about why that's so important. But here's the thing that you can do in expressing gratitude. I would encourage you to express gratitude in story form. You don't have to say once upon a time. But all you have to acknowledge is three simple things that make up stories. This is what I was going through. You can make it simple. I was, I was really feeling lonely that day. And then what the other person did. And you came to my room and... You said, come on, let's go get a cup of coffee. And then the third thing is, and that helped me feel connected. In fact, it was like I forgot I was lonely. And here's, <laughs> here's the amazing thing. When you express your gratitude, something inside of you gets nourished and something inside of them gets nourished. It's one of the most astonishing things. It's good 
for our soul. Now, I'm not asking you to say things you don't mean. And I'm not asking you to say things that, that are not really gratitude. Like, thank you for not being a complete jerk. That's, <laughs> that's not gratitude. Thanks for nothing. That's not gratitude. There's something else going on there. I'm not asking you to say things you don't mean. I'm asking you to see things you haven't seen. We all have a great deal to be grateful for, but we fail to see the value of some things. We scarf down our meals without enjoying them. I refuse to buy good food for my dog. I've seen my dog eat. <laughs> Doesn't taste it at all. Just gets it into its stomach as fast. I, so they, they sell food on, on, on television that says, oh, it tastes so good. My dog has never tasted anything in its life. It just swallows it. <laughs> it's true. And we do that. We don't savor. When was the last time you were enjoying something? You just, oh, that is so good. Listening to some music, that was so good. Hearing a funny story, that was so good. Just, we need more stop signs and red lights in our life so we can stop for just a half a second and enjoy some of the incredible gifts God has given to us. It's amazing. Good conversations, good friends, good Good TV shows. I know they're not as common, but, but every once in a while it happens. And when it does, we should really stop and thank God for that. I mean, there's a big game going on tomorrow night somewhere in western New York, so I'm told. <laughs> and, and, and the Buffalo Bills are going to play the New England Patriots. <laughs> and, and you're not going to believe this. I'm going to be at that game. And so some of you are worried. Oh, next week's message, if the Bills lose, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. No, no, no. I've, I've already planned next week's message ahead, so it will not be affected by... <laughs> it's actually starting a new series called uh, You Can't Judge a Gift by Its Wrapping. <laughs> yeah. To see the value of something, to savor something, to, to slow down and enjoy something. Expressing gratitude isn't just forcing ourselves to say something we don't mean. It's seeing something. It isn't magic. It's not an incantation. It's not saying certain words in just the right way so we get what it is we really want. Gratitude, it, science has actually showed this. When we express gratitude, there are synapses that happen in our brain that actually help us get closer to other people. And when we are ungrateful, there are synapses in our brain that actually make us more defensive and keep us distant from other people. Unhappiness is a lot less difficult to experience. But we can be grateful. So we kind of need a gratitude practice to maintain a healthy soul. Gratitude sets the conduct, the context of other things in our lives. It's amazing how often we take things out of context in our own life. One disappointing thing or painful thing happens and we rewrite the entire context of our life around that. We, because that happened, then, then these people don't love me. My future is, is not good. God has abandoned me. It's, it's amazing. I mean, you know, you can't take scripture out of context. Don't take your life out of context either. God never promised you you'd never get through uh, your life without some disappointing experiences. His promise is that he would always be with you. Um, it's, it, don't take those issues out of context. 
Don't interpret the painful experiences in your life as God's absence. You should know something about God. God is not afraid of pain. He is not afraid of darkness. He is not afraid of disease. He is not afraid of sickness. He is not afraid of failure. He is not afraid of the future. That's why he can be with us in any situation we are going through. Other people may be afraid of those things, and they might back up, but God never does. Now, we live in a culture of scarcity. Have you noticed? I mean, don't get me wrong. If in, in, the, in Western culture, we have a lot more than we need, but we also have a lot of scarcity. We feel like we're never enough. We're never young enough. We're never strong enough. We're never pretty enough. We're never rich enough. We're never smart enough. We're just, we just feel like we're not enough. And it's hard to see how God and how others are helping us when we're focused on what we are lacking or what we don't have enough of. And that's where gratitude makes the difference. It's another reason to remind ourselves why grace is so powerful. Because my value has not been established by what I have accomplished or what someone else has given to me. My value has been established by God's opinion of me and what he has done for me. You want to know what you're worth? Look at the cross. You are worth the life of his one and only son. That is absolutely remarkable. Now, fear can be interrupted by gratitude. And I'm going to have the worship team come up. Fear can be interrupted by gratitude. Have you ever had this happen? I have. Just when, some, just when something good is happening, you immediately are worried something bad will happen. Does that, that happen to you? If you're a Bills fan, it happens all the time. You know, we score and we go, oh, we scored. Oh, dear Lord, now they're going to get the ball. What's going to happen? You know, Bills fans, are, it's, it's the most astonishing thing. There, there can only be 30 seconds left to go and we can be up by 10 points. And we think there's a way to lose this game. We do. We just, we live with that kind of anxiety. You, you'll, you'll look at your child and you'll see them sleeping and you'll go, oh, they are so precious. And then the thought comes in, I wonder if something bad is going to happen to them. Fear finds a way to interrupt our enjoyment of a gift of God. So I have a recommendation for you. Interrupt your fear with gratitude. In that moment when you are afraid of what you are going to lose or what might be taken away, in that moment, just say, Father, I am so grateful for a spouse that loves me. I am so grateful for children that are healthy. I am so grateful for the provision you've brought into your life. I am so, you can interrupt your fear with a statement of gratitude. And that gratitude nourishes your soul. Fear will, will starve it out, but gratitude will nourish it. Psalm 103 says this, Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my innermost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord and forget not all of his benefits. And it goes on to tell us some of those benefits. He forgives our sins. He heals our diseases. He redeems our life from the pit. He crowns us with love. He satisfies our desire. Is there anybody else in the room this morning who is grateful for God who gives all of those things and more to us? In fact, every good gift has a source and that source is God. Every good gift, that's what James tells us. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, comes down from the Father of heavenly lights and does not change like shifting shadows. What we don't see, we don't appreciate it, but once you see it, you can. Well, Pastor, I, that really wasn't God. Just, just That person just happened to help me out. Why did they help you out? Well, they had an idea to help me out. Where did that idea come from? Where did the strength come from? Where did their time come from? Where did their resource come from? All of those capacities are gifts from God. Every good thing you've ever received has a source. It's not a random act of kindness. It's an intentional, deliberate act of a loving God. And that's why 
we have joy. How many would like to acknowledge that there is joy in the house of the Lord today? Amen? Amen. Let's all stand this morning.